Good evening. I'm glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday night service. The Lord has been dealing with my heart about something that's really got my attention. I observed and watched for the last several months, actually before the pandemic, how God's people go through this roller coaster ride. Their faith and their trust, and then they seemingly have defeat. They shout, and then it's not long until the shout is stolen from them because of things that take place in their lives and they don't comprehend, understand. And the Lord spoke into my heart about the misconception of victory. The misconception of victory. So I want to spend a little time this evening to bring to your heart enlightenment about what it really means to have victory, the purpose of victory. I want you to know there's a difference between miracles and victory. And I think that's the misconception that we try to superpose the one to be equal to the other, and they are not. I've been in this thing a long time, and I want you to know that the miraculous things of God are wonderful, and I thank God for it. I love to see God's power and His glory. But I want you to realize that miracles don't give God glory. Miracles do not give God glory. It is the result of His glory. When God walks in our midst or in your midst or comes down into your circumstance and situation, comes into your, your world and what's ever going on, God presents his glory, whatever it is, God puts it under arrest. He puts it in bondage. He casts it away. He delivers you. His glory comes down and reveals his power and his mercy and his grace and all of this phenomenal. It's unbelievable. You stand in awe of what God has done, especially since we're so unworthy. But miracles do not bring God glory. It is his glory. And I think there's a misconception of that. Miracles bring God, shows God's glory. But victory is what gives God glory. Victory is when you as a worm, you as an individual, stand in the midst of sure defeat. When everything around you is shaky, everything around you seemingly is on unstable ground and quicksand and there's no way. The numbers are against you. The odds are unbelievable that you cannot win. Everyone's saying, like they did David, flee, run, hide. Everything is contrary. Your world is seemingly upside down and you don't know which way to turn. But in the midst of that, you still stand because God told you to stand still, see my salvation. Victory is when you go into battle. If we can depend on the miracles of God to bring us out every single time, then why do we need the armor of God? Because when God's glory shows up, he scatters the enemy. He brings joy and power and just light to shine, and he turns everything around. But God told us through the writings of Paul to put on the whole armor of God that you'll be able to stand. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. Why? Because we must engage in warfare. And the only way to have victory is you've got to go to war, confront your enemy, and defeat that enemy, overcome that enemy. Stand firm and bring, bring, uh, bring revelation to the wonders and glory of God that use you and touch you and strengthen you. And that is, that is victory. That is what I'm talking about, real victory. I think many times that we see that God shows a miracle and reveals his power and his grace and his anointing only to encourage us because he knows we're going to be going into battle. And so I want to use a very familiar verse of scripture. Uh, you know the story very well about the walls of Jericho, but I want us to look at it in a different perspective tonight. I want to read out of Jericho, uh, J uh, J Joshua, the sixth chapter, the 15th and the 16th verse. Now listen to what he said, just to make it short, because so, you know the story so well. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city in the same manner seven times, only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass that on the seventh time when the priest blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, hallelujah, for the Lord hath given you the city. And the city shall be accursed, even in it, and all that are there unto the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, and she and all that are with her in her house, because she has hid the messengers that were sent. I want us to look at this and realize that there's a misconception about victory and not being a miracle. There's a difference. I want us to ask God to help us to enlighten us so that we can go into battle. We can do the things that God's called us to do. And we can put the devil off of our turf and back him up. In Jesus' name, I call it by faith. Father, touch us tonight. Anoint us. Let your divine power and glory be manifested. And everything is done. We'll give you the thanks and glory and honor first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I want you to realize what's taking place. 
God has done a miraculous thing in their life. He was sending them into the Canaan land. Now remember, the elders had already died in the wilderness because of their disobedience and unbelief. And this is a younger generation. Oh, thank God for the younger generation. I'm so glad that God's got a young people. He's got a younger generation that can still be trained and still be instilled in them the foundations and the truth of God's word and the spirit of God. Don't give up on your young people, man. Let's go to battle. We've got to have victory over them, and that's what I'm talking about. You're waiting for God to do a miracle and turn their lives around, and I'm telling you, you've got to go to the enemy's camp and loose them and set them free. And so here he is. He's got this, this band of young people and, and, a, and a new congregation. And God tells him, I want you to go into the Canaan land. You're going to take over the city of, Jordan, uh, city of Can uh, uh, Jericho. The only problem is that the Jordan River is overflowing his bank. And so God tells him what to do. He said, I want you to tell the priest to step their foot down and take the ark and go into the river. And as soon as their feet touch the, the Jordan, it's going to spread. It's going to split. It's going to rise up. And when they did exactly what God did, he showed his power. Now, the enemy's behind them. The enemy's trying to come and devour and destroy them. But as soon as they touched that river, God spoke and his glory presented itself. And the river went up like a heap on both sides. And they crossed over on dry ground. What a miraculous intervention. Even though it was unbelievable, it's impossible. When God's glory shows up, there's nothing that cannot be accomplished. I mean, we understand that. We comprehend that. That there's nothing too hard for God. We understand that God can scatter any disease. He can raise up the dead four days in the grave. God can do anything with his power and his glory because he's God. But when they got across the other side, now he told them, I want you to circumcise them. And I want you to take the reproach of Egypt off of them and prepare them because they're going to go into battle. they got to take the city of Jericho. Now, the problem with Jericho was that it was impregnable. It was a city that was massive. It had walls that were around it, surrounded, double walls. And on the inner walls, they had houses that were built on top of it. That's how big they were. No nation had ever even attempted to try to go in there and overtake Jericho because they knew it was impossible. You could not get through. They would have different defenses on the first wall. And if you could possibly get through and, and overcome the first wall, and the, the second wall was higher and taller and bigger and wider. And it was impregnable. It was impossible. It was on a hill. And you couldn't even hardly scale it. And so when nations had just realized that once they shut up the gates, that they, there's no way in. You can't get in. But God told them he wanted to overtake Jericho. And the reason why is because God wanted to show his power and his glory to the world. And he wanted to do it through his people, and the children of Israel, that he had called and chosen, brought them out of the wilderness. And so he's trying to send a message to the world, to those that are unbelieved, those who are bound. Rahab caught it. You see, she understood what took place. Because the Bible said the king of the Amorites and the king of the Canaanites fled in fear because they seen what took place at the Jordan River. And they fled in fear. It, it, they, their hearts melted within them. And they knew that this is a band of slaves. And people in the wilderness, they don't know, they'll have no training, special uh, 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 green berets or, 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 or uh, a special tra uh, forces training. Uh, nothing like that. They, they weren't a Navy SEAL team, uh, SEAL Team 6. No, they were just... Uh, former slaves and descendants of slaves, but they had God in their life. They had Jehovah that they worshiped and served, and God kept them and provided for them. I mean, through the wilderness and all the way through, now they've gone through Jordan, now they're at the base of Jericho. And God tells Joshua, he said, now this is what I want you to do, and here's your plan. I want you to realize in this that we need to get to the place that we need to learn to trust God. That when God does a miracle in your life, he's trying to encourage you, enlighten you. But God never does a miracle that he don't send you, therefore, into a place of battle. That he wants you to go and confront the enemy, and he wants you to be victorious. He sends a miracle so you can be encouraged, and your faith be lifted up, and you realize and reflect about what God's done. And then you're really with a whole heart to go in there and trust him. The problem is we want God to do the miracles for us. He want, we want God to give us the city of Jericho and all the inhabitants of, through a miraculous innovation. We see God do things in our life. You've got a sickness. You've got a financial problem. You've got a marriage. You've got a rebellious child. And you call upon God. And in the midnight hour, God delivers. God brings forth his glory and performs a miracle in your life. And you should give God praise and honor and magnify him. You should. There should be never a time you don't testify and witness. We don't see many testimonies anymore. I not wonder, is it because we're not praying and seeking God for the miraculous? Or is it because, you know, when we get it, we're just kind of selfish? 
live and just content that we got what we needed. But the fact is, is that once there's a miracle presented to you, God then encourages you and challenges you to take that and go forth and use it for a caterpillar that you can face the enemy. He wants you to confront the enemy of your soul. Miracles will, will, will not keep you. They'll just sustain you and do a special thing. But God wants you to learn to grow. Your faith can only grow in war. It can only grow in battle. It can only grow in the valley. It can only grow in the time when you confront the enemy and everything is against you. That when you come to a place of impossibility, faith then is challenged and then faith grows because you witness and experience the power of God coming down because you were willing to confront the enemy and bring God glory and give God glory. You know, Paul said that I would rather glory in my infirmities and give God the glory for all the things that the power of Christ may abide within me and all me. I glory in my infirmities. And what are you saying is I want to bring God glory in my infirmities because that's the only way you can give God glory is when you allow him to do it. Uh, in Romans 5 he wrote, you know we glory in our tribulations. Why? Because in the midst of our tribulations uh, there's a confidence, there's a, a peace, uh, there's a foundation, there's an assurance uh, that somehow, some way, God is going to bring us through. He's going to lead us and use us. We're going to be the weaponry, the tunnel, the vessel, the object that God's going to use to put the enemy at bay. He's going to use you and I. Everyone knows, every demon in hell knows, just the mention of Jesus' name makes them tremble. And they know that if God just comes down and shows up, every demon including Satan will scatter. But that don't bring God glory. What brings him glory is when a worm, when a flesh, when a man or a woman who's been saved by the blood of Christ and dedicated their lives to him and committed themselves to him and testified and witnessed about him and let their light shine in. And in the midst of all this, the power of God moves upon them and they confront the enemy and stand. That brings glory to God that a mere human can stand against a fallen angel, a seraphim angel, and know that we can come out victorious. That brings God glory. And so when he got to the place of the city of Jericho, God gave him the plan. It wasn't Joshua's plan. It was God God's plan because it is a spiritual warfare. We try to win battles on our own mindset and conception. We try to go up with our own plans and strategies, but it'll never work because anything you can come up with, Satan's already got a plot. He's already got a deceit. He's already got a demon coming out there with fear and doubt and unbelief. Listen, Jesus said, I will build my gates upon this. I will build my, 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 my church upon this rock, and the gates of hell should not prevail. The gates of hell, what is he doing? The gates is where the, the, the strategies will come. The gates where the armies were released to come forth. He'll send forth demons of doubt, demons of fear, demons of unbelief. He'll send forth demons of intimidation. He'll send forth demons to try to get you persuaded to believe you can't do it or you're not exceptional or God doesn't care about you or no one else cares about you. He'll send out these demons. But he said the gates of hell not, can, cannot prevail. Why? Because I've given you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Well, what are the keys? I know it's symbolic of authority, but what are the keys? What is authority he's talking about? He said, behold, I give you power to tread upon all the powers of the enemy, and nothing by enemies shall harm you. What is that power? It's authority. But where does that authority come? What is the keys that Jesus is talking about? It's, it's the keys of the presence of God. You're the temple of the living God. It's the key that God said, my word shall, uh, shall never pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word, the sword, the word that I give you, the promises that I speak unto you, that word that brings life, that word that brings deliverance and healing, that the word that can bring joy and open your eyes in the midst of darkness. That word, and then he says that other key, the other promise, the other key is the Holy Ghost. I'll empower you with the Holy Ghost, the third member of the, of the Godhead. And you'll have the gifts and the, and, the, and the fruits of the Holy Ghost that will empower and use you. All these things God said I've given unto you, and you can be victorious and bring me glory. And so Joshua gets to the city, and now he's got a task before him because the angel of God has appeared before him. But listen to me. Think about this. Now he had to persuade every one of these children of Israel when God had told them that you're going to go around the city. We're going to take this city. And I want you to realize that I know it's impregnable. I know that the walls are massive. I know no one's ever done it. I get sick and tired of people talking about, well, it's never been that done that way. I don't know if God can do that. I don't know if that'll work. Listen, if God speaks it, it'll come to pass. If God God tells you to do something, trust him, don't lean upon thy own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him and do what God tells you to do. But the battle was the angel of God spoke to Joshua, but he had to convince every one of the children of Israel 
struggle because he realized there had to be unity. There had to be one mind and one accord. I'm telling you, in the body of Christ, we need to get unified again that the Word of God is eternal. The promises are sure. The power of the Holy Ghost can do anything. We need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We need to be sanctified. We need to be unified in the pursuit of holiness. We need to be unified to do the things of the kingdom of God. We need to be unified with one another and love one another and live with one another and pray for one another. We need to bind together in one mind and one accord that the power of God can rest upon us, that God can have liberty to walk in our midst. We need to be focused. And Joshua had to convince him. My God, what an anointing. What an ability. How do you do that? How do you convince a congregation? Because when you've been in the presence of God, there's something changed about your nature. There's something changed about the way you speak. There's something about that anointing that pierces the heart of everyone that has fear or maybe a little doubt or unbelief. And it makes them realize, I've got to get in tune i got to get in line. He said, this is what God said we must do. And we must take this city for the glory of God. We've got to bring glory to God. I'm telling you, you got Jericho's in your life. you got battles and storms. you got fears. you got doubts. you got unbelief. And you need to face your Jericho. That's your Jericho. You need to confront it and face it. Well, how do you do that, preacher? Well, you seek God. You ask God, Lord, what would be your strategy? What would be the plan? How do you, instead of trying to do it yourself or call on friends or counseling from different ones, call upon God and ask him, Lord, what is your strategy? What would you have me to do? Here am I. Send me, God, whatever you want me to do. And then whatever he tells you, do it. Whatever he tells you will be victorious because God wants obedience is greater than sacrifice. And so he convinced him that, listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to march around this city. I want you to know, in order to do that, you got to look beyond the sight of the flesh, the carnal eye. you got to get into the, the spiritual eye, the spiritual visibility. That which you can see the invisible. God is a spirit. He's invisible. And faith is invisible. Now faith is the substance of things. Hope for the evidence of things not seen. It's invisible. Well, how do you see it? How can you recognize it? Because you've got to get in the spirit. The spiritual things of God move in the heart of a man who's spiritually minded. You get in the word and prayer and seek God. The carnal mind can receive nothing from God. It can't receive anything from God. You've got to get in the spiritual mindset and the spiritual heart and seek God and ask God to burn out any dross, take away any flesh, any doubt or fear or unbelief, anything, God, that would hinder you. God, if there's anything that's hindered my love for one another, if I have unforgiveness, God, whatever it is, take it out. It's nothing but carnality. Listen to me. If you got all against anyone in the, in the world, not only in the church, anyone, you are violating the word of God. No saint of God has a right to have all against anybody. In fact, if you got all you to leave, you give that the altar and go back and make restitution and then come back because God said, I don't want you give until you make things right because there's got to be unity. We're the body of Christ. We're the family of God. I tell them all the time. We be family. We're not perfect but we're still family. Thank God. Hallelujah. And so Joshua had to get them to realize you got to see beyond what you are focusing in the flesh. I know the walls are massive. I know that it's impregnable. I know that they've locked it down. But I know this. God said he's going to take the, take the walls up and put them down flat. But I want you to realize that that even though they were going to come down flat, it was not the end of the story. God was not going to miraculously deliver them into their hands. They had to go into the city and go into war. It was just the things that was hindering, things that was barring them, the things that was obstructing them for the promises of God. Listen, you've got things in your life that Satan or the flesh or carnality has produced and uprooted and brought before you and revealed to you that are hindering you from receiving the promises and the favor of God. You've got to make up your mind that, Lord, I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. If you'll take down that barrier, if you'll help me, God, to see your power to overcome the sin, I'll go in and confront the enemy. I, I, I'll pull the sword of the Word of God and the power of the Holy Ghost, and I will defeat the enemy of my soul. I'm going to see the invisible. I'm going to see that which is uncomprehensible in the carnal mind. I'm going to go beyond the, four, the, 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 the six things of the flesh, uh, uh, the six of the, of the humanity. I'm going to go into the fourth dimension. I'm going to see the things in order the spiritual heart and the spiritual mind can witness them. the secret things of God, the things that God reveals to those that covet Him and look for Him and search
search for him and love him and draw nigh to him. If you're not doing these things, how can God show you anything? You won't believe what he shows you. But out of the miracle that God did in Jordan, it opened their eyes and helped them to grasp and realize that God can do great things. And we must learn to trust him. We listened to our leader and we went across on dry ground and God revealed that to them and only to open their hearts and minds and take away any doubt or unbelief. He's trying to do you with this message. Any unbelief or doubt, I will command in the name of Jesus that you rebuke it and put it behind you and ask God to let you see through the spiritual eye, to have a spiritual vision, to put on the, the lens of the things of heaven that you can see the things that are impossible otherwise and let God see it. You must look through the eyes of faith and faith pierces the doubt. Faith pierces the flesh. It pierces the carnality. It pierces the world and the things of it and it goes into the heavenly. It realizes the word of God is dynamic. Shut it up. It realizes the word of God is eternal and whatsoever thus said the word of God shall not return to him void. He shall accomplish that which he says it in the place he says it to. You realize in the spiritual that you're a child of God. That your name is written down. That in, no matter who you are, it's whose you are. You're a child of the king. Hallelujah. And you're the apple of his eye. He's got your hairs covered. He loves you. He cares about you. And he wants you to experience victory, not just a miracle. Sinners can experience miracles. I pray for sinners that were in desperation. I pray for them that have been in motorcycle wrecks and car wrecks and had the horrible diagnosis from the doctor of cancer. Sinners have seen God do a miracle in their life, but that don't reveal nothing to them. They go on back and they don't understand. But when it comes to the child of God, he wants you to have a relationship that you're willing to walk into the flames of hell if he tells you to. That you're willing to stand within the gates of eternal damnation, a city of damnation, and Christ crowd that Jesus Christ is Lord that in the midst of a crowd of unbelievers if God stirs you you can't hold back that shout of praise you're going to magnify him God wants you to experience victory over your enemy, over the thing that's hindering you, the thing that's binding you the thing that's stealing your joy that thing that's stealing your shout, that thing that's stealing your vision, that thing that's stealing your ministry, the things that God's called you to do, the thing that is trying to bind you and paralyze you and cripple you and put you back in the corner You've been hurt and disappointed. Well, I've got news for you. We all have because we deal with people and people fail us many times and they hurt us. They let us down. They forget about us or they take us for granted or they even take advantage of us. We all been hurt. But listen, I'm not in this thing for people. I'm in this thing because a king loved me when I was ungodly. A king reached down and picked me up. A king took my heart that was stone and made it flesh. I'm in love with Jesus and I'm here to serve him. Everything I do is for his glory. It doesn't matter what man does to me. What matters is that God finds favor and I can walk in his midst and he'll hear me. That's what matters and that's what you got to focus on. you got to overtake your, your Jericho and allow God to do the miracle in your life. So then he said, here's the plan. I want the, I want the priests to take the seven branch horns and I want them to lead and then the trump is after them. And once a day, I want you to encompass the entire city, a massive walk, and the hot sun. Looked almost foolish to those on the wall, except they didn't understand. There was confusion them, because the enemy will be confused by your submissive and obedience to God. He'll be overwhelmed that in the midst of everything he's pouring on you, you can still sit on the pew and raise your hands and magnify God and shout. You can still go to the choir and sing the songs of Zion. You can still glorify him and testify and witness him. You can stand up in the midst of a congregation and say, listen, I know God told me he was going to heal my cancer. I know it's still there, but I'm going to believe God. I remember hearing the testimony of a lady who had a cancer on her face. It was horrible. It was ugly. And she kept, she came to the pastor one day and said, oh, I want you to know i got to testify today. God spoke to me. And she stood up in the congregation of the big church and said, God has healed me of this cancer. And I give God praise. And all they all shouted and glorified God. And after several weeks, that thing got to look worse. And the, the, she'd get up, I want to, every service, I want to give God praise. I thank God because he's healed me of this cancer. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. And they would look at her in the first couple weeks and shout with her. But after about a month, they started having doubt and started feeling sorry for her. But every service, she'd get up and testify, I want to thank God for healing this cancer. And after about three or four months, they had the little squad, the little carnal flesh, the little obstructions, those that were in the religious heart, but didn't know the king and the power of the word of God and the spirit of God come to the pastor and say, listen, she's embarrassed. We get, we get visitors and we got people and she's talking about God's healing this cancer. Now things getting ugly and it looks worse. And we want you to tell her, sit down and be quiet. We don't want to come here. We got to listen to that. And so the pastor succumbed to it. He bowed down to it and he done wrong in doing it. And he went to her and said, listen, sis, I know what you're trying to do. I know you, you believe, but the fact is it's still there. The fact is you still got a cancer and it even looks like it's growing and you're embarrassing us. So I'm going to ask you to sit down and be quiet. She said, I can't. I can't be quiet. God's healed me. He said, he has not. Listen, here's the reality. Uh, the, 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 the reality was that the cancer was there that they could see. But the truth was that God said, I've healed you. And there's a difference between truth and reality. Reality says you get out of a boat on a bridge of water and you're going to sink to the bottom and drown. But truth says, come and you walk on the water. Reality says when you go in the fiery furnace, you're going to be consumed like the ones that threw you in there. But truth says, nothing shall harm you. The smoke won't even lay on you. I'm telling you, we need to abide in truth and understand there is a reality, but what supersedes that is the truth, the power of God's word and spirit. And so she, she left that church and went to another church. And they told her the same thing after several months. Listen, you're embarrassing us. She said, I can't help it. I've got to do it. And she had a little crowd into that pastor. But he said, listen, if she wants to testify, I'm not going to hinder her. Let's pray for her. Let's not kick her down. The last church about destroyed her. We're not going to do that. And about two weeks after that took place, she went to get ready to go to church on a Sunday morning. And she went into the bathroom, went to wash her face. And she washed her face and she dried it off with a towel and pulled that towel down. That cancer slid off and underneath that cancer was perfect baby skin. God has healed her the whole time. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, you got to believe God. you got to face everything that God tells you to do and go in it with confidence and assurance. And so God told them, I want you to walk her around the walls. I know it looks foolish, but he sent the priest ahead of the ark. Why? Because he wanted the priest to trust the word of God. He wanted those in front, the leaders, to believe what God said. And so he put them first. Six days they marched around the city. My God. But it's a Jericho. It's a situation that they must do. The promises of the Canaan land all determined on this one battle. If they didn't win at Jericho, at Jericho the rest of the promise were void. Can I tell you, you're hitting the abundance of God. You're hitting the blessings of God. You're hitting all the favor that God wants you to do because of this obstacle, because of this Jericho that's in your life. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I know the Holy Ghost is convicting you if you're the one or one of the ones I'm talking to. There's some Jerichos in your life, and you've waited on God to bring a miracle and just open it up and deliver you. He's not done it. He's already done a miracle to get you to you, Jericho, and to expose it. Now God wants you to confront it and go into that city and take it for his glory and bring him glory because of your victory and obeying him in the midst of odds. It might be deep rooted. It might be something from way back in your childhood. But God is able to heal and make you anew. Hallelujah. Just press in and believe him. On six days they went around and they'd come back to the camp and they couldn't talk. They had to keep quiet as they were marching around. Didn't want no doubt, no unbelief, no sarcasm, no nothing, no pessimism, just trusting God. God said be quiet and they had to be quiet. Oh, don't you know it drove the people on the wall crazy because they, they were marching around and wouldn't say nothing. I'm sure they were throwing jeers and sarcasm and things about them and, 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 and belittling them. But there was no response praying God. But on the seventh day Joshua reminded now listen, we're gonna we're gonna go around this thing seven times a day. And on the seventh time when we get around there, oh listen, the priests are gonna blow the ram horns and the trumpets are gonna blow. And when you hear the blubber, the trumpets blow, I want you to shout a shout of praise. I want you to magnify your God. I want you to shout that you know that you know that you know that what God said will come to pass. I think we've lost a lot of shouting in the church because we don't really believe what God said. Not only in his word. 
word, but that real word he's given you one on one. That promise God has assured you. That peace that God said will be yours. That, uh, that, that, that miracle that you need or that, that, that thing in your life that you need to see turned around. And we allow ourselves to sit there on the pew or around in the company or around in the world. And when we ought to give God praise and shout, we sit there mute and we bind the hands of God. Had they not a shout the walking was not enough. The barren the ark was not enough. Listen to me. You can carry your Bible to the church all day long. You can keep it on your coffee table, you understand, all day long. But what God wanted was a shout of confidence and assurance and faith and praise and magnifying Him because that shout was going to bring glory to Jehovah God. And I'm telling you, we're missing out. We need to get back to old Pentecost rejoicing and praising and magnifying God and lifting up His name and telling the world, listen, we didn't come here to look pretty. We didn't come here to just go through a ceremony. We come to worship and praise our God. If anything we've got today is because of Him. And if we make it to heaven it's going to be because of Him. And I'm glad that He's going to keep me and that which I promised unto Him and get dedicated unto Him. He'll keep all He'll keep to that day. I'm going to believe Him and I'm going to shout and praise Him because He's God. Even though you're in the valley even though storms are raging, even though the enemy's got you surrounded, you know God is shouting and praise because in that shout it brings God God's pleasure. He loves you to magnify him. He inhabits the praises of his people, especially when you're in the valley. Anybody can shout on the mountaintop. Anybody can have shouted after the walls came down. But they shouted when they were still tall and standing, when they were firm. And he said, oh, when you hear that trumpet, I want you to shout. Shout with all your might. Not some mealy mouth little amen or hallelujah, but a shout. A magnify God. Mercy God is so good. Glory to God. Let every devil in hell hear it. I want everybody in heaven to hear it. That you're shouting for God. And when they shouted, as soon as they shouted, the Bible said that God took the walls and brought them down flat. Hallelujah. But then they had to go in the city and they had to pursue and destroy the enemy. The enemies of God and the enemies of the children of God, the Canaanites, they had to go in there and destroy them with the sword. Listen, God doesn't just give you a victory and tell you, here it is. No, you won't learn to be a baby human. You'll be a carnal Christian. You'll never have no strength, no stability. The first wind of opposition will make you flee and run and cow down. But when you go to battle and you're outnumbered and you're not even a good warrior, all you do is obey God. Every time you swing that sword, he directs it just like he did the rock of David and he directs it the right way until it's a fatal blow every single time. Until when it's all done, you're victorious. And now you can rejoice and tell your children, I was there, we went into the city and we were shouldn't have been able to win, but God brought us through. God made a way. I'm telling you, there's some Jerichos in your life, and you need to not be misconceived about the difference between a miracle and a, and a victory. The victory is when you allow God to use you and stand in a place of opposition, confront the enemy, whatever that enemy is, oh, whether it's a spirit, whether it's a feeling, whether it's a pain, whether it's a hurt, whether it's a sickness, whether it's a disease, whether it's financial or miracle, you need to confront that thing for the glory of God and declare that God will bring you through and then have victory. And that will bring glory to God. He wants glory. Hallelujah. And he won't share with nobody. I'm telling you, you need to learn to be able to shout and praise God and know the difference between a miracle and a victory. Too many have tried to Live on miracles. Go from one miracle to another. Or glean off of someone else's. Right, you know, piggyback on somebody else's miracle and shout on what God's done for them. God's got not only a miracle, but he's got a victory for you. Whatever it is you need God to do, he'll do if you just trust him. God wanted me to tell you tonight, oh, as simple as this message is, is that he don't want you to seek him, him for miracles. He don't want you to say When he performs a miracle, he, he's looking upon you. He's expecting you to go in and confront the next thing. The thing that hinders his praise and glory and honor. The thing that hinders your abundance and joy. Listen, we ought to be the most excited, happiest people on the earth. Happy are the people who the Lord is God. We ought to be a people that are settled in the midst of all this chaos. It's all right. I know it looks bad. I know it's tough. But you know what? My God is my provision. My God is the one who provides. He's all I need. His grace is sufficient. 
Don't know how it's going to come about, but God graciously sufficient. We need to praise and magnify. Well, you know, I'm not in the church. Well, listen, I want you to know you can make a, 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 a place, a, a sanctuary, a worship, a, a prayer a closet anywhere you're at. You can worship God anywhere. He don't want you just worshiping on Sunday. This ain't the Jewish belief where you had to go to a temple. No, you take God with you. I can praise Him anywhere, anytime, all the time. I had a prayer request late last night, and I got down and called upon God at the midnight hour, and God heard me. Hallelujah. I believe in God for the miraculous. I believe in God to intercede for His glory, that I can testify of all good God is. Listen, you just need to know that God's waiting on you to confront your Jericho, but you can only do it when you look through the eyes of the Spirit and through the eyes of faith. And do you know what real faith is? Can you really trust God? Can you see beyond the reality, see beyond the norm, see beyond the world, see beyond the tangible, and see the invisible? I tell them in church, dream what you want. Let your dream go forth. Dream of what you're looking for, God. Let yourself dream and believe in imagination of the glory of God doing things. Dream about it. Because if you don't dream about it, you'll never pursue it. But dream about what you want God to do. Have an imagination like a child. And then pursue it. For the glory of God, through victory, to honor Him. Hallelujah. Father, let this be a time that they grow and draw nigh, that they learn from you. That we can't live on miracles. We live because you've given us the victory. Now, thanks be unto God, which always gives us victory, but you don't hand it to us. You just open up the opportunity and give us the strategy that we can go and confront the enemy. Father, I give you praise and glory and honor for what I believe you're going to fulfilled in this message. I know you stirred my heart and I believe in you for the unbelievable and the uncomprehensible. I want to see miraculous testimonies coming forth. Even though we're not in the sanctuary, God, that we still hear great testimonies of what God's doing because people are stepping out in faith and obeying and surrendering to the word of God. Hallelujah. Oh God, in the last days we got to be firm and solid and trust you in spite of it all. And for that we'll give you the praise, Lord. We we'll believe you in everything. It's the word that's going to keep us, the grace of God, the power of God, the presence of the Holy Ghost. And so we give you praise and glory and honor first. In Jesus' name we pray. And amen. God bless you. Hope to see you on Sunday. If you're not able to come to Sanctuary, look us up on YouTube. Any village church of God on YouTube and join with us. God bless you.